So we are going to talk about the gersh gorin circle theorem. Now, in my video about the shifted inverse power method, link in the description, I talked about how we can find the eigenvalue closest to any number alpha. But the closer we choose the value alpha to an actual eigenvalue, the faster the iterations go. So we want to pick good values of alpha that we think are close to eigenvalues. And the question is, how do we figure out those values of alpha? And in fact, the gersh gorin circle theorem tells us that we can figure out that any eigenvalues of a matrix must lie within certain disks that exist on the complex plane, just like this. Now, it is possible for some eigenvalues to be complex. So for example, the matrix 0, 1, negative 1, 0 has eigenvalues lambda equals plus or minus i. But whether the actual eigenvalues are real or complex, we can figure out exactly what ranges they're going to be contained in using the gersh gorin circle theorem. And in fact, we're going to show in a second that these disks containing the eigenvalues will always have centers equal to the diagonal entries of the matrix A. So let's look at a proof for exactly why this is true. We're going to start our proof with just the definition of an eigenvector. We know that AV equals lambda V for our matrix A and some vector V and number lambda. Now what we're going to do is pick the value i to be the entry in the eigenvector v with the largest magnitude. So for example, if our eigenvector were negative 3, 2, 1, then we would just choose i is equal to 1 as the entry with the largest magnitude because negative 3 has the largest magnitude. And in fact, we'll see that we don't actually have to know what the value i is just to know that it exists, because every eigenvector is non-zero, so one of the numbers has to be the biggest. And it's not a big deal if two numbers have the same magnitude. Again, that's not going to mess us up at all. Now what we're going to do is look at the matrix vector multiplication happening on the left side, but we're only going to look at the ith entry of the resulting vector. So you probably learned in your matrix classes that if you take some matrix times a vector, the way that you find Say we want to find the top result. What we're going to do is 2 times 1 plus 0 times 1. And then we add those together, and we get 2 as the top result. What we're going to do is express that in terms of a summation. So we are going to express that matrix vector multiplication in terms of a summation. The sum from c equals 1 to n of a sub ic times v sub c. So this is saying we take the matrix A, we look at the ith row, so just that one row, and we iterate through the columns as we go down the entries of the vector, which follows the formula for matrix vector multiplication that you probably learned in class. And then we're just saying we add those all up at the end, and that is the value for our result in that particular entry. On the other side, if we think about what is the ith entry of this vector lambda v, well, that's pretty easy because lambda is just a number, so we're just going to get lambda vi on this side. Now, what we're going to do from here is split up this summation into two parts. First of all, we're going to look at aii vi, which means we just took this summation and pulled out the c equals i entry. And then we're going to add the sum, and we're just going to say c is not equal to i of the exact same thing. So we're saying splitting up the summation into everything except for a, i, i, v, i, and then have that separately. So notice this is the entry along our matrix diagonal. And then that is once again equal to lambda v, i. But notice now we have two different terms with v, i here. So if we subtract a, i, i, v, i on both sides, we get that the sum with c is not equal to i of a, i, c, v, c is equal to, and then if we factor out v, i, we get lambda minus a i i. Now from here, we're going to divide by v i on both sides. Remember that everything in this expression is just a number. Even though we're talking about matrices, the specific entries in the matrices are just numbers. So on this side, we're going to get v c like we had before, but then we divide by v i. And now we're going to take the absolute value on both sides. So the absolute value of lambda minus a i i and then the absolute value of this sum. But one thing that we know about absolute values is the absolute value of a sum is always less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. 
So for example, the absolute value of 2 plus negative 1, well, that's going to be equal to 1. And we know that's less than or equal to the absolute value of 2 plus the absolute value of negative 1, which adds to 3. So in this case, we can actually bring the absolute value inside of the sum as long as we use a less than or equal to sign. So the absolute value of lambda minus aii is going to be less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of aic vc over vi. We also know that the absolute value of a product of two numbers is equal to the product of the absolute values, meaning that for this expression over here, we're multiplying two different things in the absolute value, we can split this up. So we have the absolute value of AIC and then the absolute value of VC over VI. And here's the reason that we chose I to be the largest magnitude entry. VI is the entry of V that has the largest magnitude. It is the biggest number. So VI is always going to be greater than or equal to VC for any value of C, meaning VC over VI, the absolute value of that is less than or equal to 1 for every single entry. Meaning that because we're already looking at an inequality here, we can actually take this part away due to this inequality and say the absolute value of lambda minus AII is less than or equal to the sum with C is not equal to I of the absolute value of AIC. So this is our final statement right here describing the gersh goren disks. And each gersh goren disk is going to be centered at some diagonal i, and it's going to have a radius of this sum, of the absolute values of aic. Notice that this sum is the sum of all of the non-diagonal entries in the matrix. So let's look at an example of gersh goren disks in action. So here's our complex plane, imaginary axis right here. This is the real axis, and say we have a three by three matrix being 2, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, point 0.2, 5, 6, negative 20. What the Gershgorn circle theorem tells us is that we're going to have three disks, each corresponding to one of these diagonals, and they're all going to be centered at the diagonal entry. So this first Gershgorn disk is going to be centered at the value of 2. And it's going to have a radius equal to the sum of the absolute values of these non-diagonal entries. In this case, the non-diagonal entries are 0. So in fact, this is going to be a gersh goren disk with radius 0. So from that, we can conclude lambda equals 2 is an eigenvalue. But that's pretty lucky, because the non-diagonal entries were 0. That usually doesn't happen. So what about the second row? Well, in this case, negative 1 is going to be the center of our disk, because negative 1 is on the diagonal, and then the radius is going to be 0 plus 0.2. So it's going to be just this tiny little circle here with radius 0.2. And in this case, even though we don't know the exact eigenvalue, we have a very precise range of where we think those eigenvalues are, so we can iterate using the shifted inverse power method pretty efficiently. This bottom entry, we're going to have to extend our real axis all the way out to negative 20, and then we would have that somewhere over here, obviously this is not to scale, and then it's going to have a radius of 5 plus 6, which is 11. So it's going to look something like that. And in this case, we don't have very much precision about where the eigenvalue is, but we do have a range, thanks to these gersh goren disks. So remember that the theorem that we've proved here only establishes that all of the eigenvalues are in at least one of these disks. So before I said we know one of the eigenvalues is 2. This theorem doesn't actually tell us that, because it's possible that all of the eigenvalues are in this disk, just given this theorem, because this just says every eigenvalue is in one of these. There's some value of i where it's true. However, there's an even cooler extension of this theorem that I won't prove in this video, which says that if you have, for example, one disk that's all by itself, there must be one eigenvalue in this disk. If you have two disks that are connected, so say you had two gersh goren disks like this where they intersect, these must have exactly two eigenvalues in the union of those two circles. If you had three, maybe you have a third circle in here, then that union must have three eigenvalues in it, and so on. So in fact, we are able to conclude in this case that, for example, two is an eigenvalue, 
because there's no other disk that's intersecting it. And the same goes for this negative one disk. If it's all by itself, we know there's some eigenvalue in that tiny range, and that is really gonna help us when we use the shifted inverse power method. So just by looking at these Gershgorn disks with centers equal to the diagonal entries of the matrix and radii equal to the sum of the non-diagonal entries in each row, we're able to get a lot of information about where the eigenvalues are located, which makes iterating to compute the exact values of those eigenvalues a lot more efficient.